Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In February 2018, the quiet town of Deltona, located in eastern Florida off the Atlantic coast, was rocked by news of the brutal murder of a young man named Patrick de la Cerda. The 25-year-old man was found dead in his home, and the nature of his injuries suggested that the perpetrator had a personal grudge against him. The Patrick de la Cerda case is an example of an almost perfect, elaborate, and planned crime that may well have gone unsolved. Although the murderer was named almost immediately, no direct evidence was found to prove his guilt. As later claimed investigator Chad Weaver, who investigated the case, he realized from the beginning that it would be a real detective, worthy of screen adaptation, in fact, so it happened. Who is Patrick de la Cerda? Patrick de la Cerda was born in June 1992 in one of the most picturesque metropolitan areas, Miami, in the state of Florida. His father, Max de la Cerda, was a native of Spain, and his mother, Patricia Ronza, was born and raised in France, but in the 80s moved to the United States, where he soon married and gave birth to a son. De la Cerda family was very friendly and happy. Patrick grew up in an atmosphere of love, care, and mutual respect. He was a very kind, intelligent, and sociable guy, studied well in school, could easily become the soul of any company and chalk a lot of friends. And also the boy from childhood years was very close to his parents, who did not spare no effort and money to ensure that the son received a good education and grew up a worthy man. The head of the family worked all his life in the field of construction and was an excellent specialist in his field. The family was not rich, but was considered quite well-to-do by the standards of the big city. After graduating from high school, Patrick decided to enter the construction faculty to continue his father's work. When the young man was studying at university, his parents, after almost a quarter of a century of living together, decided to divorce. It should be noted that they parted very quietly and peacefully, without scandals, division of property, and the like. The mother moved to the quiet town of Deltona, located in the east of the state, where she soon remarried. The adult son decided to stay with his father in Miami, where they worked together and were respected and sought after professionals in the construction industry. Despite the divorce of the parents, all family members remained very close and were friendly with each other. They were always in touch with each other, calling and communicating regularly and were always ready to help when needed. Patrick regularly visited his mother in Deltona, told her about everything that was happening in his life, shared his joys and experiences, meeting the girl of his dreams. Thanks to his French-Spanish roots, the young man from an early age had a bright appearance and enjoyed great success with the fair sex. But for him has always been an example of the family in which he grew up, so Patrick did not seek frivolous and fleeting affairs. He dreamed of a bright, mutual feeling and a strong family of his own. With the girl of his dreams, De La Cerda met by chance on the internet, on one of the popular sites where lonely hearts are looking for each other. He registered there and created an account on the advice of a friend, but he himself did not fully believe that it was really possible to meet his soulmate there. One June evening in 2017, without much enthusiasm, he was flipping through the profiles of girls on the site as suddenly his attention was attracted by a photo which depicted a searing brunette with a rather unusual bright appearance. She had big, just bottomless eyes and a charming smile. Patrick was literally enchanted and decided to write to the beautiful stranger. She responded to his message and a relaxed communication started between them. The girl's name was Jessica Devnani. She was born in 1988 in the city of Orlando located in the central part of the state of Florida. After graduating from high school, she entered one of the local universities where she studied banking, and after graduating, she got a job at a bank branch in her native Orlando. Jessica was also immediately attracted to the handsome young man. For a few days, they corresponded actively on the website and then decided to exchange phone numbers. For the next couple of weeks, they called each other every evening and talked for hours about everything. The couple quickly developed mutual sympathy and trust, so the young people decided to meet in real life. But since they lived in different parts of the state, they chose a place about halfway to each other for the meeting. Already on the first date, Patrick realized that Jessica was the girl he had been looking for so long, and whom he now does not want to let go. 
She also liked him immediately, and Jessica was a little confused by the age difference because she was four years older than Patrick. On the way home, Patrick called his mother and told her that he had met the girl of his dreams, whom he wanted to marry and start a family. Patricia heard the joy and excitement in her son's voice, realized that he was serious, and was happy for him. This long-distance relationship lasted several months, and it was a big problem, because the couple could only see each other on weekends, somewhere neutral. Usually, they rented a hotel room in some cozy, secluded place and just enjoyed each other's company. But on Sunday night, everyone flew back to their homes because they had to go to work on Monday morning. Marriage Proposal In December 2017, Patrick moved to Delton, where his mother lived, to be closer to his sweetheart. He bought a house there in a quiet neighborhood and began to carry out some repair work, preparing a cozy nest for the move of his chosen one. But Jessica could not yet so immediately leave work, and they planned a housewarming party for early spring next year. On the eve of the new year, which the couple met together, the young man decided to make his girlfriend a surprise. He arranged fireworks in the backyard of the house, and while Jessica admired the fireworks, got down on one knee and held out a box with a ring, asking her the most important question, will she become his lawful wife? Jessica was unspeakably happy, and, of course, answered him in agreement. Patrick admitted that he had been looking for a ring suitable for the engagement for a long time, but he had not found the perfect one in any of the jewelry stores. All of them seemed to him not beautiful and refined enough for such an occasion. He chose the best of what was available to be able to make a proposal before the new year, but ordered another one in the jewelry workshop. An exclusive ring, the design of which the young man came up with himself. Something had happened to Patrick. Two months have passed since the engagement. Preparations for the wedding and the upcoming housewarming were in full swing. The couple's choice was approved by their parents, and they themselves were unspeakably happy, preparing for a new stage of their lives. The young people planned to arrange a lavish celebration in Miami, on the shores of the Atlantic Ocean, or in France, where the groom's mother was from. On February 27, 2018, Max de la Cerda, Patrick's father, received a call from a courier. The father's number was listed as an additional contact. The courier reported that his son's order was delivered to the specified address. But the customer does not open the door and does not answer the phone. This was very unlike Patrick. So the father immediately got worried. But since he was at work at that moment and could not go to pick up the order and at the same time to check if everything was all right with his son, Max decided to ask his future daughter-in-law he called Jessica, and with anxiety in his voice, said that he couldn't reach his son. Jessica herself had been trying to contact her fiancé since morning, but he didn't answer messages and calls. When she mentioned this to Patrick's father, Max pronounced, Something must have happened to Patrick. Jessica immediately dropped everything she was doing and headed to the groom's house as fast as she could. When she pulled up, she immediately saw Patrick's car in the driveway, which indicated that he hadn't gone anywhere. Since she had her own key, Jessica entered the yard and called out loudly to her lover several times, but there was no response. Jessica carefully opened the front door and saw a horrifying picture. Her fiancé was lying practically at the entrance, in a pool of his own blood. He showed no signs of life. Jessica immediately rushed to call the emergency services, but the paramedics who arrived on the scene were unable to help Patrick, and only declared him dead. By the time the police arrived, a distraught Jessica was sobbing in the backyard of the house where Patrick had proposed two months earlier. When one of the officers approached her, she only looked at him and told him she knew who had massacred her lover and ruined her entire life. A rich and powerful ex-boyfriend. To understand this difficult case, and to understand who could want to kill a young guy who at first glance had neither enemies nor ill-wishers, you need to go back a little bit, at the time when he and Jessica just met. The thing is that, at that time, the girl was in a relationship with a certain Gregory Bender, a wealthy businessman who owned his own investment fund. Jessica met Gregory in her student years. He was 20 years older than her, and he literally turned the young beauty's head. The businessman wooed her beautifully, gave her expensive gifts, and took her to fancy resorts. Jessica thought she had found her one and only love, but soon she began to notice some oddities in his behavior. 
Gregory sought to control his girlfriend in everything, closely watched where she goes and with whom she communicates. If Jessica had an admirer, he immediately got rid of him through threats and intimidation. At the same time, he told her almost nothing about himself. This relationship lasted almost eight years, and during this time, Gregory never introduced his chosen one to his family or friends. They met, spent time together, or went on vacation only when he wanted it, and Gregory rarely invited his girlfriend to his house. He himself argued that he was very busy. Naturally, Jessica wanted to have a normal family, to have children, but Bender said every time that it was not yet time for that. And when she tried to break off the relationship, Gregory gave her a ring and asked her to marry him. Jessica accepted, but nothing had changed. They still lived apart and saw each other only when the groom said so. One day, Gregory was in a car accident and ended up in a hospital bed. When Jessica heard about it, she rushed to him, but beforehand she decided to stop by his house to get some things for Gregory. There, Jessica ran into a woman she had never seen before and asked who she was. The stranger, instead of answering, asked her a similar question. Jessica showed the ring on her finger and said that she was the bride of the owner of the house. The woman then laughed and showed her her ring, stating that she was Bender's legal wife, Demora Sanchez Bender. After such a shocking revelation, Jessica decided to immediately part ways with the businessman who had cheated her for so many years. However, the boyfriend began to literally pursue Jessica, begging her to return, promising that he would divorce Daimora in the near future, and then they could get married. She once again believed this man, but time passed, and nothing in their relationship did not change. Finally tired of this affair, Jessica filled out a questionnaire on a dating site, where she soon met Patrick. After starting to communicate with him, she firmly decided to break up with Gregory about which she informed him, but he did not want to let her go. Obsessive Stalker At first, Bender simply persuaded Jessica to come back to him and try to start over, once again promising to divorce his wife. Then he moved on to threats and harassment, and when he realized that all this is useless, decided to search for a rival, about which at that time exactly knew nothing. He had to turn to professionals to hack into Jessica's account and find out who she was communicating with. After finding out who Patrick was and obtaining his contacts, Gregory began sending him threatening messages and demanding that he break up with Jessica, calling her his fiancé. Patrick did not react to the threats and was absolutely calm, believing that the matter would not go further than threats. But Jessica was scared because she realized that her ex-boyfriend could expect anything from her. He was a man with a lot of money and connections, and he had a huge collection of firearms that he could use. Jessica offered Patrick to break up before anyone got hurt, but he wouldn't even hear of it. Then they decided to go to the police, providing evidence that Bender was stalking and threatening them. The couple managed to get a restraining order for Gregory to approach them and try to make contact by any means. Gregory was also required to surrender all firearms stored in his home. Things calmed down for a while, and the lovers began to think that the stalker had left them alone. However, Jessica convinced Patrick that it was necessary to install CCTV cameras around and inside the house because she feared that Gregory might violate the ban. A crime scene inspection and the first theory. But let's go back to the tragic events of February 27, 2018. During the initial examination of the crime scene, Criminalists immediately ruled out the version of robbery and noted that, judging by the nature of the mutilation, this murder had a personal motive, and the perpetrator literally hated his victim. On the body of a 25-year-old guy counted four gunshot wounds, in the thigh, in the chest, and two in the head. In addition, the experts found injuries and bruises characteristic of a fall from a ladder. The body itself was lying on the floor between the front door and the stairs leading to the second floor. Investigators speculated that the killer had most likely snuck into the house and was waiting for the owner on the second floor. When an unsuspecting Patrick went inside and climbed the stairs, the intruder stepped out to meet him and fired the first bullet into his thigh. The wounded young man rolled down the stairs, and the perpetrator followed him down, fired another bullet into his chest, and then finished the victim off with two follow-up shots to the head. The murder weapon was not found, but it was a rather rare model of pistol, 
which was not easy to obtain. The first shell casing was found on the second floor of the house. Two more similar shell casings were found downstairs, but the fourth shell casing was not there, so it was assumed that the perpetrator took it away with him, perhaps as a trophy. Despite Jessica's words that she knows who killed her fiancé, the first under suspicion was the neighbor of the murdered man, with whom they had a serious conflict a couple of months ago. The man was a combat participant and a veteran of the U.S. Army, was wounded and severely concussed in the war, against which he developed a mental disorder. He was excellent with firearms and could easily get a rare model of gun. In December 2017, the veteran mistook his new neighbor for a burglar and opened fire. Luckily, no one was hurt at the time, but the neighbor was hospitalized in a psychiatric hospital due to an exacerbation of his disorder. After he returned home, he constantly followed Patrick, called him a spy, and promised to bring him out in the open. The mentally ill neighbor could indeed have a motive created by his unhealthy imagination, so the man was detained and decided to interrogate. He made no secret of his intense dislike for Patrick, but at the time of the murder itself, he had a 100% alibi, which was confirmed by several people. Searching for evidence and trying to provoke the perpetrator. So, the version of the robbery from the very beginning cancelled, because in the house everything was in its place and the money and valuables remained untouched. Only hard disks with recordings made by video surveillance cameras were missing, so it was impossible to trace who entered and left the house that day. In addition, no evidence at all was found at the crime scene. Forensic experts could not find a single fingerprint, shoe print, or DNA trace. The murder was carefully thought out and planned, and although the investigation had little doubt that Gregory was behind it all, it seemed at the time that he could get away with it. The police decided to go on the sly and ask Jessica to call her former lover and bring him to a frank conversation. Jessica agreed without hesitation. She dialed Bender's number and made a spectacle of herself. She blamed him for what had happened, cried, and kept asking why he'd done it. But Gregory seemed to have figured out what the investigators were up to from the start and persisted in pretending he didn't understand. When Jessica said that he killed her fiancé, the businessman pretended to be surprised by this news and after expressed his condolences to the ex-girlfriend. To get Gregory to confess, to make him mad or to force him to commit a blunder, never succeeded. The police had no reason to detain or question the man. He could only be called to testify. But he honored the restraining order and seemed to have let the ex-girlfriend go long ago. The Killer's Notes While the investigation was treading water, trying to find any clues, the police received a call from Daimora Sanchez Bender, saying that she had important information about the Patrick de la Cerda case. The woman was immediately invited to the station for an interview, where she said that shortly before the crime she saw a strange notebook on her husband's desk in his office. Looking into it, Demora found a detailed plan of some stranger's house, and next to it, there was a strange algorithm of actions. She hadn't paid any attention to it at the time, but when Dimora saw a news report about the brutal murder of a young man, and the story showed the plan of his house, she immediately remembered the sketches of her unfaithful husband, with whom she was on the verge of divorce, and decided to tell the investigators. This information gave the police enough reason to search the house of the alleged perpetrator. The mysterious notebook, about which the wife of the businessman spoke, was found in the office, but the pages with the plan of the house and other records were removed. However, they were soon found in the office, but in a trash can that Gregory had apparently failed or forgotten to empty. He had simply ripped out the pages, crumpled them up, and tossed them in the trash. Apparently, he was confident that his house would not be searched, since there was no evidence against him. On the sheets of paper, in addition to the layout of the house, there was a detailed plan of the crime itself. It became clear that the criminal had prepared long and thoroughly, working out every point. In particular, it was said about the need to turn off the phone, use gloves and lubricate the soles of shoes with a special compound so that it did not leave traces on the floor. From the records, it became clear that Gregory followed his victim, knew what time Patrick returned home, and was aware of the presence of surveillance cameras in the house and yard. In addition, Gregory made sure to dispose of the crime weapon, dirty clothes, shoes, and gloves. 
He was only let down by the fact that his own records had not been destroyed in time and his wife's curiosity. In addition, a fourth missing shell casing was found on the table, in a cigar box, which the gunman was supposed to have carried off as a trophy. Forensics confirmed that it was the exact same shell casing from the crime scene. The trial and the defense attorney's attempts to shift the blame to Jessica. The evidence was enough to arrest Gregory and initiate a trial. But the main problem was that all the evidence found could be called circumstantial, because the crime weapon was never found. There was no evidence that the accused had ever been to the victim's house, and there were no witnesses. Bender's trial did not begin until May 2021, more than three years after his atrocity. During this time, he hired the best lawyers, who had time to thoroughly prepare for the case. The businessman was optimistic and seemed to believe that he would get away with it. Jessica was a key witness. She detailed her relationship with Gregory over many years, how she learned he was married and tried to break up with him, as well as the harassment and threats he made against her and Patrick. As evidence, she provided saved screenshots of correspondence as well as phone records. In response, Bender's attorneys attempted to shift all the blame onto Jessica. The defense stated that Jessica herself provoked Gregory with her behavior because she registered on a dating site and started a new relationship, not yet broken up with Gregory, which hurt his pride and ego. Also, Jessica was accused of mercantilism, noting that she liked to receive expensive gifts from a rich suitor. The main evidence, sheets with records of the murder plan, the lawyers called only a fantasy of a wounded man who wanted to take revenge on his rival. At the same time, the defense insisted that the defendant did not go further than plans and fantasies, so his traces at the scene of the crime were not found. In addition, according to the lawyers, the search in the house of their client was illegal and was conducted with violations, and therefore the second evidence, a shell casing, he could simply plant it in the process. The crime weapon was also not found, and the model of the gun Jessica identified from a picture, saying that she had previously seen it in the collection of her boyfriend. But she could be wrong, because she was not well-versed in weapons. Ex-wife testimony and final judgment. At one of the sessions, the defendant's now ex-wife, Dimora Sanchez, was called as a witness. The man, who had hitherto looked indifferent, suddenly became animated and unexpectedly confessed his love for her. The ex-wife was moved by this confession and apparently changed her mind about testifying against Gregory. She confused her testimony, citing her forgetfulness, and finally added that she had lived with the man for many years and doubted that he was capable of murder. Despite attempts by defense attorneys to challenge the legality of the search of the defendant's home, despite his ex-wife's unexpected statement, and despite the lack of direct evidence, the jury, after hours of deliberation, still found Gregory Bender guilty of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment, barring him from ever being eligible for parole. As the judge read out the sentence, the defendant stared at Jessica intently, seemingly without even blinking. He was literally glaring at her, which made her feel sick and almost had a panic attack. She sat next to her late fiancé's mother and at one point began sobbing and literally choking. Despite numerous attempts by Bender and his highly paid lawyers to appeal the verdict and get the case reviewed, all of their appeals were rejected. Not the least role in this played a wide resonance of the case in society, because a wealthy millionaire businessman in cold blood massacred a simple working man and tried to get away with it. The story of Patrick de la Querda was widely covered in the press. With Gregory Bender still behind bars at the moment, Jessica Devnani says she feels safe and continues to live for Patrick and keep his memory alive. She wears the ring he gave her as a gift, as well as that exclusive piece of jewelry Patrick never got around to giving her. Jessica maintains a close relationship with her deceased fiance's parents, who treat her like their own daughter. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to the channel and don't forget to click on the bell. Not to miss new stories from around the world. See you soon. Take care.